wants to take you deeper than the challenges that are in your life so you understand exactly why jesus is in you and why you are in christ welcome to a dynamic and life transforming program impacting generations with the word of god christ has been made our wisdom his christ the wisdom and the power of god he's not just the power without the wisdom and he cannot be complete to be wisdom without the power because the wisdom of god evokes the power of god on your life here is the narrow make man with apostle grace Huber. recently uh, this particular week uh, when i was teaching uh, I, I mentioned something and I promised that I was going to touch it on Sunday, touching the light, okay? Uh, touching the light, touching the lights, understanding how uh, the lights work. What are these lights? And I will show you the confusion. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14, it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself, is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is not great a thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Hallelujah, glory to God. So they're telling us that Satan can transform or is transformed as an angel of light. Now, the Corinthian book says no marvel meaning in some circumstances it would have been a marvel, a marvel it could be a marvel it is a marvel to some people and that is why it says no marvel because in some instances it is a marvel it, it is amazing to look at it is something that marvels the carnal man. It's something that is amazing to those that see it. But say, uh, Paul says, no marvel. In other words, it should not marvel you because there is a way how he can do it, okay? There's a way he can do it. And, and the reason why there's a space that says no marvel, it means somebody marvels or anybody who has the ability to see that or who has seen that or has come to that understanding, they are marveled, okay? Because we know the light uh, by Christ, by God. And now we see Satan transformed as an angel of light. It's, it's a marveling thing. It's this, uh, but also, in there is the confusion of the hour and the things that I feel I need to, 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 to take into account in, in, in the sharing today. Because you see, the, there are two lights here. There's the light of the glorious gospel in Christ Jesus. And now we see that Satan is transformed as, a, as, a, as an angel of light and that his ministers, no one are transformed into ministers of righteousness. That, so how do we then tell the difference? Okay, and the Bible says the end is revealed of their own works. Okay, but we see the end in the revelation of their own works. We shall know them by their fruits. But that does not mean that if you are a reader of the word, if you're a child of God, you're not given grace to discern even before the end of these things. God has given us a spirit of discernment. All right? Discernment is not reactional. The spirit of discernment is not a reactional spirit. Okay? It's not the spirit that has to get to the end of a matter to discern it, to understand it, to interpret it, to 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 deal with it the designing spirit can begin uh, uh, from the beginning it, it is in part of the prevenient graces of God to help you because some people don't have by the time you get to the end of understanding the works and ways of a man sometimes the destruction is done the damage is there and there's nothing much that can be done so we need to understand these two lights right we need to understand these two lights um, I'll begin this way I believe one of the biggest deceptions that have existed in this hour, but has been for quite a long time. Again, it's in our traditions, it's in our folklore, it's in our stories, it's in our, you know, cultures, it's in the movies, it's in the uh, the, the books, uh, story books that we read. It's 
it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's on the TV shows, it's, it's in our imaginations, it's on the conversations of tea um, and parents are dealing with their children. Is, is how Satan is depicted. Because when you talk about Satan, Lucifer, the devil, you're thinking about snakes. You're thinking about dragons. You're thinking about gargoyles. You're thinking about goblins. You're thinking about these kinds of things. So in the movies, they, saw, they, they show you a devil and he's dark and, and he's green and he's laughing in a very you know, uh, funny way. He's, he has a very cosy voice and he's masking himself in, with, with threat and he's probably trying to consume this. And it's the thriller movies that we're watching. It's, it's all of those things. And so people think actually, and, and people have swallowed the lie that that is how Satan appears to people. <laughs> that is how Satan appears to people. If, if the serpent appeared to Eve in a way that was disturbing to Eve, I don't think Eve would have given that serpent uh, even a minute to speak. I don't think that the, the, the serpent was repelling to Eve and Adam as was communicating. Okay? Satan does not appear that way. When you start reading the word, you start to see that the appearance of that fellow is not so much the way we have depicted him. Okay? So when he comes in a form of light, when he comes in a form of goodness, when he comes in a form of love, when he comes in a form of beauty, when he comes in a form of service, when he comes in a form of... of, of, of of, of virtue we cannot tell many a time because the picture that we have been given again is of tradition and folklore it's the cheap stories that we've been given and Satan has intentionally let that happen and, 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 and spread that as reality to the hearts of men because he knows in there he can continue his craft uh, of hiding of concealing his true reality you need to understand who Lucifer was. So some of you who know, and I'll take some time to share this. Lucifer, Satan, is a fallen angel. He was one of the um, most amazingly created cherubim. Okay? Now, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12, uh, time is taken to help us understand who this fellow is. And here he comes as a king of Tyre or Tyrus. Uh, in the 12th verse, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord. I want you to listen. Thou sealest up the son, full of wisdom. He was made with wisdom. And perfect in beauty. And I want you to underline the word perfect in beauty. That means Satan, Lucifer, was beautifully made. He was a beautiful cherubim. It was a beautiful cherub, okay? And thou, verses 13, has been in Eden and the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the burial, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the cabanco and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. You are the anointed cherub that covereth. And I've said this so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou walked, walked, walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Satan, Lucifer, was made beautifully. It was a beautiful cherub. In fact, scripture tells us that he was deceived into pride because of his beauty. So why do people think that because he fell, he's all of a sudden going to look ugly? He's all of a sudden going to look dark? He's all of a sudden going to look, you know, uh, unrepresentable? He's all of a sudden going to look uh, like darkness? No, 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 no. 
the scripture is clear on how this fellow was created. The scripture is clear on the perfection of beauty of this cherub. When Satan fell, he did not lose that beauty. It's not anywhere in scripture that because of his fallen nature, therefore he lost the beauty. Okay? In fact, the name Lucifer, Lucifer means giver of light or light bearer or the shining one. So not only was he made beautiful, but he had a light that was coming out of him. What makes people think, again I ask, that Satan is going to appear like the dragons that you see? Like the gargoyles that you see, like the goblins that you see, like the snakes that, that you see, like these things with, you know, horns and they have red eyes and funny teeth. Now what makes you think that Satan is going to appear like that? Yet scripture is clear in the nature of the creation of that cherub. Satan was made so beautiful, okay? He was so beautifully made that in that beauty was the deception of pride. Iniquity was found in him because of beauty. He looked at himself and then he said, you see, the closest thing that can connect to his beauty is God. And because he felt that way, then he is tempted uh, to, to start... Uh, seeking a place of being like God or as God. We must understand where that came from. Uh, one, it opens us uh, up our eyes to really appreciate and understand the power of beauty in the conversion of conviction. Okay? The power of beauty in the conversion of conviction, human conviction. Many people are enticed by whatever looks beautiful in their own eyes at least. Because Satan knows the power of beauty. God is the author of beauty. So we're not saying that God is in the ugly stuff. No. But we're only saying that Satan has a way of disguising himself in the glory of beauty because he knows the conversion that comes in the conviction of beauty. Do you know why it was hard for certain people to design the Christ? Because the Bible says there was nothing beautiful about him. If Jesus came in a certain beauty, in a certain, with a certain face, with a, with a certain you know, natural beauty, it would have probably been easy for people to design. In Isaiah 53 verse 2, if you will read it from the message version, he speaks of the servant that grew up before God. He calls him a scrawny seedling, a shrubby plant in a patched field. And he says, and there was nothing attractive about him, nothing to, take, to cause us to take a second look. Jesus Christ did not come in a beauty in a certain attraction that would cause somebody to, to have a second look. I, I know you know what I mean. Like, like a handsome fellow passes, and then you look at them, and then you turn your eye back again and just look and say, hmm, that guy, you understand? Or a beautiful woman passes, and then you throw a second look. Jesus was the kind of fellow that would pass, and you see their face and not look back. But he was the savior the lord the creator he was one with the father you only needed to understand his beauty through the revelation of his person and that is the mystery of the glorious light of the gospel the mystery of the glorious light of the gospel is from within to without the deceptive light is usually from without to within. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. The light in the Genesis shined out of darkness. It came out of darkness and shined. You see, it's from within to without. The Bible tells us, uh, and, and I'll read for you in 2 Corinthians. 
chapter 4, verses 6, verses 5. He says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, for your, uh, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. He says, For God, who commanded to the light to shine out of darkness, the Bible says, He has shined in our faces. In our faces? No. He has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. It, the, it's the beauty. It is the light from within. It shines from within. To understand the beauty of God, you need to go in God. Okay, the book of Psalms 29 verses 2, he says, Give unto the Lord the glory and to his name, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Okay, that is a beauty that not many people are able to interpret, expre explain, and, 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 and express in articulation. Because it's a beauty that is only in the realm of the revelation of the person of God. It is a hidden beauty. But that beautifies everything without. So the difference between the, 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 the light of God and the light in which Satan is transformed. Or the satanic world or the Luciferian mind is transformed is simple. The Luciferian satanic looks so much at the things beauty without to seek a justification of a beauty within. The godly light is a giver of light within and expresses or manifests that light without in its beauty. So the designer of light is a man who takes time to look firstly within than without. And when you look within, the, the most fundamental substance of within comes through knowledge. Knowledge. The beautification of the Christ was in the revelation of the person of the Father. The beauty of, of, of the satanic or the Luciferian is seduction. It lowers men by 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 by, by, by beautifying without, but without the revelation of knowledge. The revelation of knowledge. So if it is to give knowledge, it has to twist that knowledge and preach a knowledge from without and make it appear like it is a knowledge from within. Okay? So that the ministers that are translated, and I'll come to, back to that later, are people who speak a knowledge of without but appear as though they are speaking a knowledge from within remember I said it is the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ it is in the heart beauty the beauty of the Christ begins from the heart the human heart the spirit man and then comes without it's not so much in the things that people see outside so I'm not saying that God does not carry beauty, does not, is, not, is not interested in beauty. Listen, he is the author of all beauty. But do you see that the beautification, the, the distinction of the beauty of God begins in his holiness? Now when we define holiness, what do we mean? Some people think holiness is just a moral, a good moral living. Some people think that's just the definition of holiness, good moral living, that when you are a morally upright person, therefore you're living in the holiness or you are the true depiction of holiness. Now, listen, even if a man has lived 100% morally upright and he has not received Jesus as his Lord and Savior, you cannot say that that man is holy. Okay? You cannot say that that man is holy. Because when you read the Bible, you realize that holiness is a nature. It's not the action. The action follows the nature. The Bible says the new man has been created in true holiness. True holiness. That means it's, it's, it's the epitome of his nature. He is created 
in true holiness and righteousness the true holiness that means there is a false holiness and the false holiness is the justification of holiness by the things people see without and not the conviction of that man's heart toward God and we've had people who have learned to live so okay outside but inside their tombs they're dead within they've buried stuff okay they've buried stuff and we have people that are not yet perfect without but their hearts are on the right course that is why the Bible says uh, be holy even as ye are holy so you are not working out righteous uh, uh, holiness to become holy you are walking in the holiness of God because you are by nature holy okay holiness is a nature now to behold the beauty of the holiness of God is to delve into the deepest realm of God's glory and presence and not many people have hit those places not many people have seen that kind of beauty not many people have seen that kind of expression not many people have had the opportunity by the spirit to see the beauty of God's holiness so when you say God is holy what do we mean what do we mean if he created what is diverting and deceiving men this Lucifer fellow and, and this is just Lucifer is just a creation how much more the heart of that God the spirit of God that created that beauty how much then beauty is in him and he says my beauty is expressed in my holiness it's expressed in my holiness it's expressed in my holiness I've shared a story before there's the experiences that are good for sharing for people and there are those that are personal I don't think are healthy for sharing but I've taken time to usually share some of the things that I know are beneficial for you and one of those I said I had a vision one day where the heavens opened and the cherubim seraphim the worshiping I saw and I saw this wonderful throne God on his throne but I could not see the person of God because of the of the light the uh, blinding light that came from that throne and I could see angels on the left and on the right. I could see the cherubim. I could see the seraphim. I could see them worshiping him. I could see, I, I, I saw a beauty that I have no words up to today to explain. Even if I try, I can only explain to the degree the words that are given me by grace can. But no word is ever sufficient enough to define that beauty. I've had, I've been blessed. Uh, uh, in this life to have a few experiences of encounters with Christ okay the notable encounters with Christ but nothing drawn in picture can ever express the beauty of holiness that comes with the person of Christ nothing no picture drawn by man looks like this person because when you encounter the Christ, the beauty of that Christ goes beyond anything a human face uh, could ever represent as beauty. It goes so within into a person of beauty, of words that nothing in this world can ever express. But to see that is to understand the difference between the beauty of his holiness, the light of Christ and the light of deception and that which is of darkness that is to know the difference okay so Satan has learned the art of um, creating darkness I mean creating light in his darkness okay and Paul says if the light in thee be darkness so oh, how great darkness it is if the light in thee be darkness oh what a great darkness it is he's trying to say that there are people who are in the dark and still do and act and relate so much with darkness that it is evident that they are dark. But there are also people who by reason of subtlety have learned the art of presenting and appearing like a light 
and it says if you if 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 a man has transceded or transitioned into the place of appearing as light yet he is dark then paul says that is great darkness so the man who still or the entity or element that still appears like a, like darkness and acts like darkness and shows the ways of darkness that one is not as dark or has not transceded in darkness as to the degree or the level of a one who has not only carried darkness in their lives but has even learned to translate that darkness to appear as light that is what they call subtlety that is what they call craftiness so he says now his ministers also are transformed as ministers of righteousness that means that the ministers of Satan that there are two kinds of ministers of Satan or Lucifer they're the kind there there's a kind that is expressing demonic worship flat right out okay secret societies the Illuminati the skull and bones and all these guys and you know uh, you know they, 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 they're doing it in their songs they're doing it in their movies they're showing signs they're showing you know those those are those are already dark but they express themselves in darkness all right and their end is dark the fruit becomes dark but it's not only that their end of fruit or works are dark even the process of expression is dark if a, if a secular uh, artist okay does the signs of the devil on tv or then you know and then writes you know triple six or what or you know all these you know shenanigans all that nonsense of the demonic and is showing the symbols and signs and expressions and modes of worship and degrees of masonry and stuff that one is dark but he has not been able yet to translate himself to the level of that darkness appearing as light that is not as dark as the person who appears so like light and righteous yet they are dark he says that is greater darkness that is greater darkness all right so jesus says through paul that actually the ministers his ministers satan ministers remember if you go earlier you're talking about false apostles false prophets and false these false as false teachers Da, 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 da. now he says now these ministers his ministers are transformed as ministers of righteousness but their end shall be according to their works so some people can't discern until the end comes and they see the works all right but if you are a reader of the word you can discern that through how they express this righteousness and the expression of this righteousness is in the discernment of true doctrine true doctrine i'll give you an example the new testament paul the man new testament uh, writer paul who writes uh, the biggest part of the new testament which we read today canonized by our forefathers you see that paul enters synagogues and is beaten he's thrown out he goes in cities Lystra and Derby he's beaten and he's thrown out then he starts to speak of his testations he's been caned you know 39 times he's been marooned he's been, been shipwrecked he's been hungry he's been he, he tells you all the challenges that he went through as a preacher of the gospel but if you will ask yourself the question who put him through this it was not unbelievers no it's not the unbelievers that put paul through this he was actually religious leaders so if paul was a bearer of the truth and light of the glorious gospel 
How come then he's in dyings often? He's abandoned in prisons. He's in stripes above measure. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, 23, 20, uh, 23 to 24, if you read in the message version, he says, are they, are they servants of Christ? He says, I can go them one better. I can't believe I'm saying these things. He says, it's crazy to talk this way. But I, I started. I'm going to finish. He says, I've worked much harder, been jailed more times often. He says, I've been beaten up more times than they can count at death's door time after time i've been flogged five times with the jews 39 lashes he says i've been beaten by roman roads three times uh, pummeled with rocks once i've been shipwrecked three times i've been immersed in the open sea for a night and day he says in hard traveling year in and out have been i've had to ford rivers and fend off robbers struggle with friends da, 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 da. i've been at risk in the city at risk in the country endangered by the desert the sun the sea the storm betrayed by those i thought were my brothers and then you ask so you mean paul went through 99 percent of his stations on the hands of his brethren yes sir Satan, I mean, you need to understand this. Satan has a way of being disguised in those who appear to be the most godly, the correctors of all the wrongs in the world. You understand? So we see all of those things happening to Paul through those he called his brethren, the Jews, but not just the Jews. It was Judistic believers, folk that followed Judaism as a teaching, men that had the Torah in their hands. Oh, but Paul did the same. Stephen was stoned before him on his watch. And during that time, he was uh, taught by Gamaliel, Okay, one of the greatest teachers of Judaism. He was one of the most celebrated scholars of his time when it came to the Judistic teaching. But lo and behold, when they're killing Stephanos, it's the clothes uh, of this man that are thrown on his feet. Remember his conversion on his way to Damascus. What had he done? He had arrested all the believers and taken them to Damascus. To deal with them and that is when he gets an encounter with God what was that thing in Paul that arrested believers what was that thing later that we see through the Pharisees the Sadducees and Nisans you know the order of the church in Jerusalem that was under Judaism or Judistic teaching what was that thing in them that sought to kill the man that you and I are quoting in 2020 Weren't they ministers of righteousness? Weren't they men who were teaching in their time, who were celebrated as great teachers, great scholars, men who were of not only moral upbringing and uprightness, but were enforcers of the same? Men who even had nothing to be blamed over, but these are the same people that are killing Paul that are killing the disciples, that are killing the apostles. In Romans 3, 8, he says, some slanderously say and report us to say that let us do evil, that we say that let us do evil so good may come whose damnation is just. Who was slanderously reporting Paul? It was these religious people, not the outright atheist, the non-believer. The non-believer. Do you know if you're a reader or if you're an ardent follower of church politics across the world, the biggest wars are between believers, not non-believers? Which doctors don't attack us? No. We attack ourselves more than which doctors attack us. The heathen don't attack the church like we the believers attack ourselves more so in the born again faiths 
research was done and they said that the Pentecostal movement is divided in more than a thousand denominations and all of those are divergent opinions and views about the same man and the same book. We have opinions about everything and everybody and we're not ashamed to write about them on social media and speak about them because we think that we are the right ones and they're the wrong ones. The Bible says that he that does not love does not know God and there are things love cannot do. Love cannot slander. Those are works of the devil. Remember Satan, the meaning the accuser of the brethren. So if you go and then go on Facebook or what's happened, start slandering or gossiping about a believer, of whose spirit are you? Your works are evident. But you are the Christian who gets in church and starts to rashakata. Zoko, 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 zoko. Shile ba 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 ba. Zuko robo bo bo bo. You see? So what is that thing in you? that just wakes up to slander. Okay, let's just say you don't agree with them. What does the Bible say with those you don't agree? You pray for them or you go to them or you, you admonish them, you correct them, you, you, you do things in love, but if the end comes to that, and why, why and, and I've already say, say this to preachers, why would you mention a man's name on your pulpit? Why would you mention a ministry's name on your pulpit? It doesn't matter whether you are right, but you're not true. Because according to the teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, love constrains and it takes eternal wisdom to understand that constraint. It, it takes eternal wisdom to understand that constraint. But I've heard fellow believers, pastors who go on the pulpit or in the radio stations and television stations mentions them, mentions the ministry. Okay, if you don't agree with a brother or a sister about some, then mention what you don't agree with. But you cannot go ahead and mention their names and mention their ministries and to, to the public, a group of folk who are un un unstable, ill-equipped and skilled because that already depicts who you are in the heart and who you're representing. Who you're representing. You see? So, the, 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 you see that Paul was beaten, persecuted, abused, and, and, and you know, blackmailed mostly by those that appear to be his own brethren. And, and call, uh, Paul calls that so dark. Why does he call it so dark? Because they have mastered the art of being dark and transforming themselves as ministers of righteousness. Paul says that's more dark. So I tell people, some of you fear these funny women who smoke pipes and what and shake things this is funny which doctors who dress like mermaids and then shake themselves those are nothing cowrie shells in the head those are nothing the most dangerous ones have even theology degrees and phds the most dangerous ones are they even have titles they are bishops they are apostles they are prophets they are evangelists they are they are you know chief overseers they are vision bearers you know they are doctors some of them are the most dangerous and they've brought unfortunately some of the biggest damage reverence fathers some of those have brought the biggest damage in the body of Christ more than the average person why because they have learned to transform as ministers of light, yet in their hearts they are dark. And that is why in Hebrews 6, 6 chapter 4, when he speaks of the people that have been enlightened, he speaks about those which were once enlightened. Okay, they tested the heavenly gift, partakers of the Holy Ghost, 
They know the power of the ages and the world to come. They, they sense it. And he it says it's a hard thing to get some of these people back if they should fall off, seeing they crucify the Son of God again. Why? Because when a man has tested the Holy Spirit, when a man has had a heavenly experience, has been enlightened and seen the world to come and seen all of that, and he has experienced and tested that light because not many people have had that opportunity to see the things some people have seen. But if a man has had an opportunity to see all those things and still incline himself into darkness, it is a hard thing. Because why is it hard? Because you need to, it's almost as though you need to take back the whole thing that Christ did to start the story again for him. And, and which is impossible because Christ has died once. He has died once. He has died once. That is why the Bible emphasizes the love of truth. And speaks of men who refuse to love the truth. To love the truth. To love the truth. To love the truth. To be a lover of the truth. And because the Bible says they love not the truth. The Bible says good gives them over. He, he, he says, you know, I think, and to give them over means he let them go their own way. Because if, if by invitation of love he could not come, how, 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 how else is he going to invite you? Okay? I'll read for you something uh, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verses 7. Let me begin with verse 7. And, and let me read the amplified version. He says, for the mystery of lawlessness, that hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority is already at work in the world, but it is restrained only until who restrains is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by his appearing at his coming. He says, the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and working of Satan and will be attended by great power and with all sorts of pretended miracles and signs and delusive marvels of them all lying wonders and by unlimited seduction to evil, seduction to evil, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, going to perdition, because they did not welcome the truth but refuse to love it that they might be saved. They, you, you need to be a lover of the truth. And therefore, because they refuse to be saved, God sends upon them, or let, in fact, the word sends upon them, but it's God who institutes to send, but he lets, okay, misleading influence, a working of error, and a strong delusion to make them believe what is false in order that they might all be judged and condemned who did not believe who refused to adhere to trust and rely on the truth but instead took pleasure in unrighteousness here the, the catching phrase is the love of truth they did not love the truth what do i mean when i say be a lover of the truth i'm not saying be one who quotes the scriptures. To quote the scriptures doesn't mean you're a lover of the truth. No. To love the truth is to respect the word. And do it as it says. And be able to repent when you are off the course of that word. Okay? When you are off the course of that word. Some people justify even what is not right. And that means you're not a lover of the truth. Let's just say, and, and I tell people, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I'm not talking about, you know, that you've not made mistakes. No, all of us have made errors. We have made mistakes. We've done stuff that we, we, we regret we never did. Okay? But the smoldering week, God does not burn out. He intends to find it to have life and flame. Because he knows that you're a work in progress. Okay? But he gives you two kinds of people in scripture. He gives you a story of the proud um, Pharisee who says, I thank God. 
that I fast this many times a day. I give tithes of common and meat. I do this and I give to the poor. And I do this, okay? Uh, the, the, in, in Luke 18, chapter 11, uh, if you read uh, in, in the, I, I want to read it in the Amplified Version, you know, in the Message Version. Now, there were two men that went up to the temple to pray. And, and this is the true representation of one who, the, the lover and the despiser, okay? And one Pharisee, the other was a taxman. So the Pharisee posed and prayed like this. He says, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people who are robbers and crooks, adulterers, oh heaven forbid, like this particular taxman, I fast twice a week and tithe all my income. He says, meanwhile, the taxman, eh, there's another story here, the taxman slumped in the shadows, his face in his hands, not daring to look up, say, God, give mercy, forgive me, for I'm a sinner. And Jesus commented, this tax man was not the other that went home and made right with God. He says, if you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you'll become more than yourself. So it was this tax man that, that went home right. Not the fellow who was living rights. I'm not saying I'm against right living, but God has given us an allegory of two fellows who all had two opinions about life. I fast a lot. I did this. And I thank you because I'm not like that pastor who does this. I'm not like that bishop who does this. I'm not like that apostle who does this. That apostle does this. That, that guy, eh, he does this. That minister, he did this and did this. Oh, have you read about him? He did this. And, 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 and God said, and then there's another minister, maybe fallen. You could be right or wrong. And if you're wrong, you're even darker. Okay. So, probably this fellow is wrong. This sister is wrong. And she's struggling. She's fighting with some. Okay. And, and I've seen it many of time among believers. Call it a whole pastor. And a whole pastor does that. So you're actually trying to say, <laughs> you're trying to tell God and the people around you that you have more understanding, better peripheral, deeper weights than the man or woman of God that you are judging at that particular hour because you appear to know and maybe live or do better than that particular man of God. And God still anointed that man and left you who was good. Me, how could he ignore you? Yet you're the righteous one. Huh? You're the pastor, you're the man of God who loves God and the rest are not. You're the man of God who is on the mountain, the, the Moses who is on the mountain while Aaron is down here and, and Aaron is messing up with the children of Israel and is teaching them demonic worship. What? <laughs> And God starts to deal with you as a minister. And things start to break around you in your righteousness. Because God is trying to say, you are a minister, you are a believer like that person. And I have all called you to the same standard of the word. And you might think I'm on your side because you say that. But let me show you that I'm actually the other side. You continue running your ministry and business and craft and wares. Let me show you that I'm actually this side. If you don't get it now, you'll get it 20 years. If you don't get it in 20 years, you'll get it in 30 years. If you don't understand it, the children you'll produce will understand it. God is amazing. I fear God. And so me, as an individual, I have exercised myself not to be quick to judge. Because I don't know where, I, I don't know where this is going. I can judge a matter, but not an individual. I can judge a thing or a practice, but not an individual. Because I'm not a judger of men. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I'm a minister of the gospel. Some men were worse five years ago and perhaps better than you now. 
Okay, so God checks our hearts. God examines our hearts. He knows us. He knows us. He knows how to look at us. And, and, I, and I was sharing with my wife this morning, and I told her, look, I have noticed that there are people who appear so good, so righteous, ministers of righteousness, but you don't see the reward of a man who has really walked with God. And in my years of experience, I've come to prove every man is where they are supposed to be because of their dealing in the things of God. It doesn't matter how articulate they can be, it doesn't matter how deep they are, it does, every man is where they are truly supposed to be. God does not give responsibilities in the kingdom based on your qualifications. He gives best on the heart, your heart. And some minds are well educated, but their hearts are dark. Some minds know how or what to do, but their hearts are dark. And until God helps you examine yourself and connect to really where you, you are and go to him as you are, not as Apostle Grace is, not comparing yourself with Apostle Grace or Pastor so and so, Bishop so and so, Evangelist or Prophet so and so. You deal, you mind your own course. You ask God to deal with you specifically. And, and, and one of the reasons why, as a ministry, we are growing is simple we really mind our own business. We do. And mind my own business. I mind my own business. It doesn't mean that social media or TV stations don't call us. They do call me. TV stations call me all the time. And big ones. And they want to take my opinions about this man of God or that man of God. Pastor Gondi, Pastor so and so. The one who is this. What do you think? And you've never had me comment on a television, radio, Facebook or anything about an individual minister, ministry or the church. I don't do that on secular platforms. And there's a reason. But it doesn't mean that these people don't call us. No, TV stations call me all the time. But there's a reason why. It doesn't mean that the people you see all there or is there on TV, they're, they're the ones who they want to call. No. Some of us, they probably want to even speak to us more than some of the people you see on televisions giving opinions. But we can't be there giving opinions. So and so is pregnant. What do you think? This woman of God, her husband left her. What do you think? What do you think about these mushrooming churches? You see, <laughs> you see, because when I go to God, I go to God based on Father, I'm here. Me, deal with me. I have my course. I tell people that the gospel is a very long game. It's very long. We have many years ahead. And two, three years down the road, some have already fainted. So I can imagine where the the next 10 years they are going to be, the next, how they are going to live if you've already fainted now and some of you or us are still strong and we still have the power to go in and out but the brooks are drying, the ministries are failing and you, you will not even sense when a man is speaking in love because there's so much darkness and hate in you that you think they can only attack you. You see? So God help us. God help us. God help us. Uh, and, and, and I want to come to a close in this way. That now we see the ministers of darkness transformed as ministers of righteousness. They look like they are the preachers of what is right. But they are wanting. Okay? So love the word. Be a lover of truth. Be a doer of truth. Do not let anything take you off the course of the word. If this lying is bad, 
repent of it and move on if gossip and slander is bad write to the person you've gossiped and repent and move on if if you know do what is right before god and if you are a work in progress still go to god and say god i thank you i'm your righteousness in christ jesus and i know that you're taking uh the robbery out of me in the name of jesus it's not in me you know do do the right repentance according to the revelation of christ but whichever you do walk right before god he has a way of rewarding his own in the mighty name of Jesus. I'll call upon the choir. As we close, I want to pray with you right now. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the mystery that you revealed to us this morning. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will help us, that you will break us, that you will bend us, that you will deal with us, that you will align us, that you will correct us, that you will have mercy. God, have mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy, God. As they're new every morning, God, we drink from that mercy and look to you, the author and finish of our faith. We are not called to compare or be better than the rest. We're called to walk the course that you've given us and that by a peradventure God we will make it because none of us is of ourselves and neither the ministry or responsibilities you've given us are not of us but for your glory and the expansion of your kingdom may we always keep that consciousness in Jesus mighty name we have prayed and believed Amen. If you are there and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ and you say, you know what, Apostles, you are speaking, I feel I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to give you the opportunity to say these words with me as you pray. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for my life. I thank you that you died and were raised again for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior and born again. Amen. If you've made that prayer, please go on for narrow.org slash salvation. Put your name, your number, your details. We want to follow you up. We want to send you an email, send you a text. We want to hear, you know, the works of God touching you and celebrate with you as the angelic celebrate. And I pray for the sick right now. There's somebody right now listening to me and you're praying for your family. A lot is broken in your family. And, and, and I hear a name of one of your members in the family called George. And then George has a drinking problem. Very big drug drinking problem. God is coming into your house and is going to do things like you have never seen or heard. In the mighty name of Jesus. I speak healing for somebody with a pain in your in the back of your neck it's just below you know the line of your hair in the head it's behind here God is healing you right now in the name of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ meningitis is healing right now in the name of Jesus I rebuke those viruses HIV cancer cells you you are cast from the root in the name of Jesus Christ I command heart disease to go in the mighty name of Jesus. I speak healing to an eye issue. Somebody has developed an eye problem and your eye has been swelling for some days. I command that eye to shrink in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, because you've healed and more than the words that I've spoken in Jesus' mighty name. I've prayed and believed. Amen. I hope to hear from you. I hope... Uh, to see you i hope to be here on thursday and i'll ask the choir to give us a song even as we close he has done great things he has done this broadcast was brought to you by Fenero ministries international for more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals, 
and timely updates. The Finero app, available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at finero.org. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Finero, make manners.